Happy Friday and welcome to a very special Brain Scratch. Actually, I consider the next two to be very special episodes. A lot of you might not know this, but this month is actually the five-year anniversary of Brain Scratch. And this is a show that started about a topic, a particular topic, which was the Elisa Lam case. And uh, February also marks a month for when she was discovered back in 2013. So we've got a very special guest uh, lined up with us today. And then we've also got some really special materials that I'm so excited to share with you guys, but that's going to be coming out on an episode next week. With all that being said, let me go ahead and welcome our special guest, Mr. Jake Anderson, who is the author of Gone at Midnight. What's up, Jake? Hey, John. Good, good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you, too. It's like uh, like old days. Um, <laughs> Jake and I uh, worked together a little bit on a documentary. We're going to talk about, a little bit about the documentary as well, looking into the Elisa Lamb case. Uh, when was that that we shot that? Was that October 2017? I, I think it really was back in 2017. Um, the, years, the, the years are really starting to uh, meld together for me. But yeah, it's... Um, that's when we were going hard on the documentary. Yeah. 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 And uh, essentially, I got flown out to Los Angeles to shoot for a weekend with them. We had uh, a really uh, a lot of work done over that weekend. I mean, it was just like, go, go, go the whole time. Um, and I really appreciated being a part of it. Jake and I kind of developed a relationship a little bit before that, um, just talking about the case and one of the things that I really admired about you, Jake, was your point of view about looking at this case. Now, I know originally um, you had a website called The Ghost Diaries, and when you first contacted me and I heard that that was kind of the thing you were known for, I was just a little bit like, uh-oh, you know, because there's so many people that hit the paranormal angle on Elisa Lamb, and then they just get stuck there. Right. One of the things that I really wanted to tell you is first of all, thank you. Um, because the intent of brain scratch for me has always been to dive into something and then leave the trail of where I got to so that other people could see it and pick it up and then check it out for themselves. And quite honestly, the book gone at midnight is the best example that I've seen of someone doing what I intended brain scratch to do of really taking all that re researching it for themselves finding out additional information and contributing to the conversation. So, um, thank you. And that's, that's high praise coming from you. I, I admire the hell out of what you do. And I, I, I you know, so I, I think, um, I think we both had the right intentions working into this case. And, um, I think we shared a common, uh, commonality when it comes to kind of destigmatizing some of these cases and looking for evidence. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, not being afraid to dig beyond the kind of ghost story version of it. Cause it, it's weird, Jake, just looking at what's been happening with this story over the past several years, you know, I, I know that I get contacted by producers all the time. You get contacted by producers all the time. There's always some new Elisa lamb, something that's going on in this space, but, I originally started Brain Scratch because I wanted to move the conversation away from the elevator game and the invisibility cloak and yeah. all these other theories that people were using to kind of push this, these stories forward um, and club them to a real event. And that's kind of, I felt like it wasn't very respectful to the event. Thankfully, YouTube has had a boom in people doing coverage like I was intending. People that are taking these things seriously and trying to look at them and actually help progress these cases. I did a search just yesterday for Elisa Lam on YouTube and I was surprised to see that the horror, the horror story version, the spooky story versions, they're not going anywhere. They're still being produced like crazy. Um, people are still using this to pull attention to themselves and it, it seems like to, to simply get views and they use that kind of initial version of the story where you have all those unexplainable mysteries, you know, the girl in the water tank, how did the lid get back on? I mean, it sounds like a, like a David Blaine magic act in some ways. Um, right. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, 
my goal in this was to first and foremost destigmatize the victim, uh, give a portrait of her um, that you know all of these videos and all of these blogs that people have put out. Um, I, I don't assume bad faith um, necessarily, but I think people definitely um, in this kind of new age of uh, kind of viral true crime internet culture, I think we lose track of the tragedy at the center of it, and the and and uh, the fact that this was a very incredible individual, um, and that's what I you know the main reason I wanted to do the book is it gave me a chance to really delve in to that, and so uh, you know it's funny that you uh, are praising me for um, kind of my methodology, but I mean I. I I wrote about in the book, as I'm sure you know, like I, I view you as a, you know, really a prime mover of a kind of new movement uh, to use web sleuthing as a kind of parallel responsible criminal justice pursuit. And I, I, I think, I don't think there's anyone else doing it like you. So kudos, man. And thank you. And I'm re I'm really glad that we've gotten to know each other. Yeah. And um, on this case, particularly, I, I think, I think people are going to be, um, refreshed by how we approach this in the coming hours i um and i don't want people to to get the assumption that we're just going to be here patting each other's backs but i, <laughs> I can't help but do this because honestly we don't get to talk to each other a whole lot uh we communicate a lot just in terms of you know hey this guy contacted me what's going on over there um but there's something you did with this story that is very brave in my eyes and that's that you worked in your personal experience with suffering with an emotional disorder as well. And Elisa, it, it, it honors her in such a strong way because she was so open about her struggles socially on, on social media. Um, and to have someone, first of all, just to share that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's very, very brave of you. Can you tell us a little bit about coming to the decision to do that? And is, was that hard for you to open up like that? Great. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, and that you, you're hitting on exactly kind of the, the origins and my compass and my, the North star kind of that I used to guide me through this, um, was that yes, when I first started researching this case, obviously I was interested in the kind of spookiness of the elevator tape and you know it struck everyone as kind of just this almost just existential mystery of you know what happened um but what really guided me from the beginning well first and foremost there was a kind of um i was interested in the sociology behind the case uh which is you know so many people were interested in this case and so many were interested in a variety of reasons. Uh, the, the case, uh, you know, it, it's an overused metaphor, but it, the case is kind of a, a Rorschach test. Um, yeah. People would look at it and whatever their worldview was, whether it be, you know, spiritual reckoning or homicide uh, or, you know, cold case homicides, um, they, they were just kind of, uh, you know, projecting that onto the case. Right. And so I was interested in, in why this case was triggering so many reactions like that. Uh, and in addition to that, those two angles, there was from the very beginning, this narrative of mental illness. And the reason for that, of course, is because Elisa was very open. She publicly documented her struggle with depression and with bipolar disorder, which really uh, kind of started taking over her life uh, in the years before she died. And I always thought it was in incredibly brave of her to do that. Um, not many people are so open uh, about that. Um, and so it's very valuable. Her blogs are very valuable, I think, as a running diary and documentation of the progression of a mental illness yeah. and yeah. the battles she went through. And, you know, a lot of people quote certain things from her, her blogs, but it's, it's almost always just these select few things that people think are creepy or, you know, whatnot, but there are unbelievable 
passages in there where she is, it's, it's someone reckoning, it's a young woman reckoning with mental illness in a very brave way. So I was drawn to that. And part of the reason I was drawn to it is because I have always, since turning 18, I've, I've suffered with chronic depression for most of my life. And it's, um, it's just something that people, people with it, um, it's like this secret language we have where we know what we're talking about. And so I wanted to kind of help destigmatize that because I think it's an important narrative and it was something that not a lot of people were talking about. Um, and the more I went into her blogs, the more I looked at her writing, it was just incredible to me how um, detailed she was. And my investigation of the case basically was contemporaneous with a kind of, uh, I guess, psychological kind of meltdown that I was having. And there was all kinds of reasons, you know, relationship things, stuff like that. But it all was kind of a perfect storm that hit me while I was investigating the case. And so it was just, it was so, it was a story that I felt like could bring a new, a new uh, lens onto this case, which is that uh, mental illness is an epidemic right now. Um, hundreds of thousands of people are committing suicide every year, yeah. and we don't really ever talk about it um, except when a celebrity dies. And another thing about Elise's blogs is that if you go look into the comment section under her posts. It, it's it's literally just dozens or hundreds of people sharing their stories about mental illness, really honest accounts. And, and so it became a kind of community and it still is a kind of community, yeah. not just yeah. for depression, but for bipolar, which uh, is a very problematic illness for many reasons that we can get into. But yeah, so, you know, I appreciate that you recognize that aspect of it. And um, I felt like if I was going to explore someone's life, I mean, she had already made these things public, right? Mm -hmm. But if I was going to rebroadcast them in some way, I felt like it was just a responsibility of mine to share something of myself and to be as personal with my life as she was with hers. Mm -hmm. uh, not just because it connects, but because I just feel like I felt a duty to do that. So yes, the book does contain a lot of my personal struggles, but it, it you know, I, I felt like, yeah, I just felt like that needed to happen. It also, um, you know, something that a lot of producers that I've talked to that try to take on this topic talk about is it's hard to connect um, your heart to this story without being able to speak to a family member in particular, you know, someone right. that was very close to her, someone that um, is, you know, suffering that loss. As a matter of fact, right. I had one producer where that was just the stopping point for him. Like he couldn't take the story anywhere because everyone was like, where's the heart of this story? How are you going to connect this to people? And that's where I thought you being so open about what you were going through. Um, first of all, there's some crazy synchronicity, I think is the term that you were using in the book time and time again. Um, some very interesting parallels that are going on with what you're going through emotionally as you're looking into this case that almost make you wonder, you know, is, is there something else going on in this universe for sure? Um, but outside of that, it does respect and honor the original intent that she had of putting herself out there and letting those con those conversations go and, and kind of leading those conversations in a way. And it just continues it in such a respectful way. And I think it does give the heart to the story that I've, I've heard people keep saying, you know, they, how are we going to get people to connect to this? On the flip side of that, we see media like, I don't know if you saw the recent HLN special, the real life nightmares coverage right. where they had an expert supposedly. And it seemed like she completely missed the fact that this was a young woman that was suffering from depression and bipolar disorder. I mean, it was like, right. like she just wasn't versed in it at all. It was crazy. So that's, but yeah, that, just to add on to that real quick, yeah. that it was almost the, the family was probably the biggest problem for me because I just did not feel, I did not feel good about it. Quite frankly, I still don't feel great about it. Um, this is a family that has suffered 
it's just unfathomable what they've been through to yeah. lose someone yeah. like that in such a horrible way. And then for it to be broadcast and almost kind of frivolously litigated in public like this for so many years, it's just unbelievable. And I don't blame them at all for not wanting to speak to anyone. Uh, I totally get it. And that was going to be a stopping point for me um, until in the middle of my investigation, while I was staying at the Cecil Hotel, which I document in the book, I basically realized, uh, you know, 10 years of, of confusedly trying to diagnose myself, I realized that I'm on the bipolar spectrum. It's a very difficult illness to diagnose. And we, there's all kinds of stereotypes and false, false perceptions of what bipolar disorder is like. Mm -hmm. And bipolar spectrum is very large and there's a lot of different variations and permutations and it does run in my family and it it uh it you know it took the life of my my aunt which was something that drove me to want to kind of discuss this publicly um bipolar has a very high uh suicidality rate and it basically just kind of clicked all of a sudden that my god i mean i am you know bipolar type 2 and lots of people are and it's not it's nothing to be ashamed of it's not a big deal but you do need to acknowledge it treat it get help and we have as a society we have to stop um, we, we have to stop pretending like mental illness is not a major issue um, so that drove me to go in and, you know that was why i started working on this. I did not expect to actually start, you know, really investigating the case itself and looking for new evidence. And because as you know, John, all pretty much all three major sources of information of where things could come from, the hotel, the police and the family, they're all on lockdown, you know, no one yeah. speaks. So there's very, there was very little information about it. And that's another thing I wanted to do was to actually try and find some solid information in addition to just kind of these repeated, um, facts. Uh, and some of them aren't even facts. Some of them are speculative that are thrown around. I wanted to try and land on some real concrete a little bit for this case. Um, so going into it, I did not expect to end up writing a book that was essentially about what I think is a cover-up. And I was almost torn about that as I worked on it. I, w- I was torn about, wait, you started this to try and destigmatize mental illness. And now here you are writing about the potentiality for foul play and even in parts about uh, weird paranormal stuff. And, and I don't mean it in any sense of demons, but I really did experience some strange synchronicities. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case. Um, but this is a complex, large story and it deserves, it deserves a, uh, a scalpel to diagnose it instead of a sledgehammer, which is what you're seeing online most of the time. That is very, very well said. And let me also say that, uh, it's interesting for me because very often I will get, you know, like books sent to me or, or different works on, on different topics. And sometimes I start looking into this stuff and I just go, oh, no, you know, oh, they're going this way with it. Oh, they're going that way with it. And I, while I felt a little bit of that ride while I was reading this book, it, they were always done in very respectful ways. Like you're bringing up the possibility that this should be considered. And right. There's not an overarching drive towards any particular, you know, this is what I think is is happening and I'm going to try to convince you guys of it. And here's, you know, 300 pages to convince you that I'm right. That is not going on here at all. This is like an internal exploration. Um, and you're weaving in so many different things. There's the aspect of Los Angeles. There's the history of that area. There's the some of the history of LAPD and some of their challenges. Um there's all these different things that are weaving together to really flesh out what this story is and all those different aspects. Um, in case you guys can't tell, I absolutely loved it. I read it in one day. I never do that with books. It literally wow. just grabbed my attention and pulled me from start to finish. Uh, by far, one of my favorite true crime novels that I've ever read. And admittedly, 
I might be just a tad bit biased because it was super cool when I bumped into sections that mentioned Brain Scratch and John Lord. And I was like, hey, I know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm so happy to hear you say that, man. And, and honestly, I told you this before, but uh, I was probably more nervous about your reaction to it than I was my own editor because you, I know you have a, a high standard for how to approach these cases. And I also knew that you pretty much at the start throughout paranormal and I pretty much did too. And, and mm -hmm. for the record, this book is not, um, a treatise on paranormal activity whatsoever. Right. But there is a history of the Cecil hotel that is very morbid mm -hmm. and very strange. And the, the legacy of this place being haunted is part of the narrative. It's just part of the story. Yeah. And it has to be told. It has to be told in a way that is not stigmatizing because, and I'll say this multiple times, uh, mental illness and foul play are not mutually exclusive in this case. Right. And nor is anything mutually exclusive. We, we have to always remember that reality is comprised of a number of different competing narratives. And it's our job as conscious beings who biological animals that have our own psychology and hormone hormones and chemicals running through our brains we are biased and so we have to look for raw data and always remember that we are biased um, but to f take the case as a totality of these three different narratives that were going on yeah um, so I'm really very uh, I really appreciate your praise man yeah no and um I feel that way too uh, about stuff when I'm looking at it. I get worried because I'm like, I know I'm very critical. I know this topic is extremely close to my heart and how is Jake going to handle it? I think one of the tragedies in this, just just to kind of sum up um, the, the talk about the uh, bipolar disorder and how that affects this is you made such a good point about you need to ask for help. You need to seek treatment for this and and really learn how to live with it. And, you know, it's part of your life. How are you going to be successful while you're dealing with it? Um, and I think that is one of the absolute heartbreaks of this story is we have someone that's speaking openly about this. She's basically putting it out there for the world to see, hey, I'm, I'm suffering, I'm struggling, and this is how, and this is what I think about it. And we know she's getting help because she's got medications. We know that she's taken at least some of those medications. And even, you know, some conclusions around that, I don't know if we could really be firm about or not. You know, they're saying that only two of the medications were found in her blood, but there wasn't really enough blood for extensive testing. Um, but that's the heartbreaking aspect of this story is this seems like someone that was really trying to head that off, even to the point of taking this vacation. You know, like, hey, she's she knows her life isn't going where she was anticipating it. She's struggling at school. She's basically taking some downtime from school and she's going to go see the world for a little bit and and try to reset. Um, and then, of course, we have this tragic outcome that happens here. And the cases that always affect me the most are when it's it's young people that you feel like are on a path to learn something about themselves and then some tragedy happens and they never get to have a second chance or to make that discovery. And, uh, Elisa is the prime example of that. And I just also wanted to say Elisa and her story is really responsible for five years of, of brain scratch for hundreds of other cases that we've looked at literally thousands of dollars. We've donated to numerous different causes and cases all of it started because of Elisa's story. I never forget that. Um, and that's also part of why I try to include myself in as many of these conversations as possible, because there are so many other people out there that want to tell you a, a ghost story. Sounds great around the campfire. And the realities of this story mean so much more than that version of it. So um, there's even a, a recent project that's kicking up. I'm flying out next week to go shoot with them as well, because I want to make sure that we're bringing this voice this that we're talking about right here, the realities of this case to these different productions and hopefully steering them in, in that direction instead of turning them into ghost stories. Right. And, and, and there's a time and place for ghost stories and, yeah. you know, just, just for the record, my site, the ghost diaries actually initially started as a, a skeptic, a skeptical approach to it. 
mm-hmm. but uh, kind of a fascination with the f- philosophy and even some of the new science uh, and you know some of the kind of the quantum enigmas that go along with uh, I, I think there is a, a there can be a case to made for residual information left behind by consciousness and stuff like that. But my point is that my approach to paranormal has always been from a you know kind of philosophical skeptical position. And so the Ghost Diaries was more about documenting those those investigations, but also uh, a, a voice for the dead. You know, the Ghost Diaries. I consider it, it's a place to tell stories about people like Elisa, who was really going to be on a great emotional arc. And I think she would have she would have found herself. I think she was on the path to that. And like you said, it's just yeah, it's, we cannot overlook the tragedy of of just an incredible person whose um, whose life was cut short, just totally absurdly, regardless of what happened. Right. Um, that cannot be overlooked. But at the same time, I think, and you'll agree with this, Elisa, I think, would want uh, her case litigated because I don't, I cannot think of too many worse things than to have mental illness and then to die um because of some either accident or some kind of foul play or whatever it was. And we're, we're going to get into our theories on that, mm-hmm. but to then, to then have your death blamed on your own mental illness. Um, you know, to me that is, is, is the, is the worst stigmatization, which is that, uh, you know, the police kind of framing this from the very beginning as, as an accident due to mental illness, which it could have been. And, but it, like we said, it's not mutually exclusive. There are other narratives at play here. And I don't think it's fair to her to just sum up her demise, uh, with such just an, you know, uh, it's just, it's not that simple. It's literally on the autopsy report that a contributing factor to her death is bipolar disorder. Right. And how would you? And yet the police, I spoke to, I I couldn't even believe he talked to me, but the LAPD psychologist spoke to me on the phone. The detectives did not once consult him or his team about bipolar disorder. So they listed this cause of death without even doing their due diligence on the nature of bipolar, what it would look like. It's, it's, It's very irresponsible to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean... An accidental death is an accidental de- dental death. It could happen in all kinds of different ways. Um, how would it, they would know that bipolar was necessarily a contributing factor to that is is a very interesting twist. Probably because of the toxicology results. Um, maybe them looking at that and saying, hey, it looks like uh, she wasn't taking all of her medications that day or something. Um, I don't know. but uh, I certainly don't consider myself having solved the case in any way whatsoever. But I do think I've put together a, re- a very reasonable argument that something is being covered up. And I think the autopsy is part of it. Well, and I think another part of it from your perspective has to do with Charles Dormer, right? And this was Absolute. absolutely yeah, this was an aspect to the case that I never really went down. I, I didn't go down this avenue. So I'm, I'm curious if you could just share with us uh, what is the story with Charles Dormer? How does this affect the case? Right. So Charles Dorner was an LAPD officer uh, who was fired basically because he spoke out against excessive force. Um, he spoke out against his one of his supervising officers, basically kicking the hell out of a mentally ill suspect. And he raised an issue with it and he pushed it and they fired him. And Charles Dorner uh, went off the deep end and he uh, basically launched what he called uh, asymmetrical war against the LAPD. So it's really an unprecedented um, event. We've never seen anything like that. We've never seen an ex LAPD officer, um, you know, wage war, actual violent war against the department he was assassinating people and he, he was determined. He had targets. He listed 
40 or 50 different officers that he was going to target. And this was the same week, the week that he, that they were really going after him, the manhunt that ended up with him dying a somewhat suspicious death in a cabin uh, in the woods that this was going on the same week of the Elisa Lam investigation. So it, it stands to reason that there was a lot of distraction. I mean, it doesn't stand to reason. I, I've, I've spoken with officers who just straight up said, yeah, we were losing our minds. I mean, we were, this was crazy. We'd never seen anything like this. We were completely overwhelmed. And so a lot of resources and attention were diverted toward that. So when we get into the idea of a botched investigation, um, I think it's important to remember what was going on that week, uh, which was really yeah an unprecedented event. And sadly, a lot of the accusations that Charles Dorner made in his what's known as his Facebook manifesto, which he wrote out, he listed um, really just shocking abuses by the LAPD. Mm-hmm. He would describe LAPD officers letting victims bleed out. He would, uh, they would regularly plant evidence. And this is, this is an accusation that comes up again and again in different books, going back to the Rampart scandal, which was, you know, a major police scandal in LAPD, yeah. which is yeah. that they, uh, officers would regularly carry around a spare gun that they could use to plant uh, on a suspect if they needed more evidence to arrest him. They would brutalize suspects. And all of these accusations he made are corroborated by other sources, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Well, he was off the deep end, and I certainly don't condone anything he did. I mean, it was he turned into a monster. Uh, but, you know, whoever chases monsters, as the saying goes, risks becoming one. And I think there was a lot of LAPD officers starting from the Rampart scandal and moving forward that believed they could get away with a lot of, of corruption, unfortunately. And there's more to say about the LAPD, but yeah, but you, you know, people have to buy the book too. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really interesting aspect. Uh, what about the time frame of that now? Cause Elisa was a missing person and then, you know, we've, we've got weeks that passed there. When is this uh, Dorner issue going on around this? So it was, it was, uh, I mean, it was going on for months before, but it kind of climaxed during that same week that Elisa went missing. Um, uh-huh. uh, I, I don't have an exact timetable in front of me, but yeah. it was, uh, I mean, the week that, basically the week where they found the body, her body, uh, that was the week where the Dorner manhunt climaxed. And uh, so... Yeah, you have to wonder if they uh, had all hands on deck for, you know, a missing Canadian girl um, in a Skid Row hotel. Sure, certainly doesn't sound like they would have. And we've got some big questions about how they could have missed her. One of those big questions is, uh, according to information that came out in the civil suit that was being filed uh, by the family against the Cecil Hotel, which I was really thankful for because to the point you were talking about earlier, there's this version of this story that keeps going around and no one really has any facts. But now we have a civil suit that's going on and we've got legal documentation that's coming out as part of that. Uh, I started buying those documents. I'm pretty sure I've shared them with you also. Oh, yeah. um, and then we start learning about people like Santiago Lopez and his story about actually discovering her. And one of the big points of contention in Elisa's story is, was the hatch on or was the hatch off? Now, according to those legal documents and what Santiago says, he went up there and the hatch was off. Uh, on top of that, we know that this, the roof was searched at least twice by LAPD. They say they also took dogs through the building looking for her. So it raises a very big question of how did they not find her if the hatch was off? And literally, if you stand on the roof, what are you investigating if you're even standing on the roof? You literally just have the water tanks and the building that's right behind them, and that's it that's up there. So um, you came to a very interesting conclusion about Santiago. You tried to verify the information, right? Yes. Uh, well, 
I always viewed the issue of the lid as a extremely important question, possibly one of the most important from a viewpoint of, um, you know, just from a evidentiary viewpoint, um, realistically speaking, these lids are, um, these lids are pretty heavy. Um, certainly not too heavy that they couldn't be lifted by Elisa, but the reality is it's just, just about physically impossible that she would have been able to cover, cover her, put the lid back over her head as she was climbing in. If the LAPD narrative of her death is what they say is that she, uh, you know, took her clothes off, climbed into the tank and brought her clothes with her. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the logistics of the tank, the physics of it. There's just no way that she could have pulled that lid over her head. So it being open, I, I think was always a very, um, always was helping to point toward that idea that this was an accidental death of her climbing in the tank on her own. If the lid was closed, that changes everything. Right. It, 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 it really does change everything. And so I really wanted to try and learn about this. Now, Santiago did testify in a deposition for the civil case, as did the general manager, Amy Price, and the civil engineer, uh, Pedro Tovar. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they, and Lopez maintained that the lid was, was open when he found it. Okay. I, so I, I reached out to a few first responders, uh, LAPD, some of the people that were first on the scene. And one of them was, and I believe his name is Andrew Smith. Uh, and he is now a uh, chief of police in Wisconsin. Uh, a city in Wisconsin. I think it may be Madison. I'm not sure. But uh, he, but at the time, he was working for the LAPD, and he was one of the first people there. Now, there was an interview where he said when he showed up that the lids were closed. Okay, well, I wanted to check with that. Uh, were they really closed? So I emailed him. I actually did not expect him to respond, but he did. And he said unequivocally, the lid where she was found, the tank where she was found, that lid was closed when they arrived. Now, is it possible that uh, Santiago Lopez discovered the body, alerted his uh, bosses, his supervisors, and then as the police were arriving, closed it back up? That's possible. Um, for me, if I'm working at a place and I discover a, a body. I'm not touching anything else. I'm getting away from there. I'm not contaminating anything. I'm not changing anything. So if I get up there and the lid is open, I'm not going to close it. Um, it that, that, so, I mean, it's possible, yeah. but, and, and it's just another reason that we have to have access to someone like that. Um, and so I went really hard trying to find Santiago Lopez and I, I I hired a investigative journalist, my friend Lou, who is just a bulldog when it comes to things. You know, he's um he just has that you know muckraker attitude where he's going to find the truth. He's going to get someone to talk. He spoke to Santiago Lopez's half brother, and the half brother, you know, Lou is very meticulous about. Um, confirming things. Mm -hmm. He uses a lot of uh, sophisticated software to make sure people are who they say they are. He does his back. He does his homework. He does his background. And he says that Santiago Lopez's half brother told him that Santiago abruptly moved his family out of Los Angeles to Mexico. And this happened after the civil deposition in which I believe it's very possible that he perjured himself. So his half brother said that Santiago was given a large sum of money. He doesn't know by who, but that it happened so quickly and so abruptly that he didn't even know Santiago was gone. And all of a sudden he found out that Santiago had moved himself and his whole family out of Los Angeles. He had worked at the Cecil hotel for about three years at that point. And he was paid a large sum of money by, 
you know, we don't know for sure. Obviously, the initial supposition is that the hotel paid him. Um, could they have done it just to get him out of the way? Or maybe he had a complaint with them and they settled with him by giving him money. But it, boy, it's awfully suspicious that right after this deposition, it, which was eerily all three accounts by him and Price and Tovar, they were all eerily similar as though they had worked out these talking points ahead of time. Definitely. No, they, they definitely did. I mean, they, they probably had a lawyer that they were sitting with uh, th that was drafting all that stuff up. Yeah, it was. Um, there was a lot of defense that was built into to those depositions for sure. Right. And you and you discuss those in depth in your videos. Um, and, you know, a lot of my starting points for looking at uh, almost all of the major issues I looked into were, you know, some of my starting points were, you know, questions you asked in your videos, which yeah. I, I yeah. found extreme because because you're not um, you're not given to unnecessary conspiracy conjecture. You're yeah. looking at it from just a logical standpoint. You do with all your cases. And it's what makes your channel so great is that you um you're you're trying to look at raw data and then make uh assumptions or not assumptions but you're trying to draw conclusions from that but you're not saying this is necessarily true or this is necessarily true right um but it it has to be noted and i mean i guess this is going on record for the first time i mean it's in the book and there's more detail to it in the book but he uh this is an accus this is a statement from his half brother who it should be noted was not willingly giving this up you know this was not or he was not enthusiastically giving it up he was not looking for attention he didn't go on some tv interview looking for money or anything like that right he and he was act he, he was obvious he was a little bit taken aback afterwards and he basically ghosted my investigator after giving that initial information I think he realized he had said too much or he had said information that he probably shouldn't have said something sensitive, obviously. And so he ghosted him. And so at that point I brought in or I, I hired a, a private investigator who's based in Mexico. And this guy spent months and months and months, six months or more, uh, trying to find Santiago Lopez in Mexico and he could not. And so as of right now, Santiago Lopez, the man who discovered Elisa's body, possibly perjured himself about how he found the body and was paid a large sum of money to leave. He is off the radar right now. Yeah. Very, very strange. Um, and this is someone that had worked there for years before. If I recall from the deposition, he started there in 2010. We have this yeah, go down. Yeah, we have this go down in, in 2013. Um, I did want to note, because this is something that a lot of different people that talk about this story don't quite seem to grasp, but the the hatch on top of the water tank is literally a square piece of metal that has a lip over it, and you remove the whole thing. It, there's no right. hinge. And right. I do believe some of the other water tanks up there have hinge, have hinges, but that one in particular has no hinge, right, um, which makes it even more exceedingly impossible that she could have closed it over herself. Exactly. Exactly. That there's, it just, I can't even imagine how you do it. You'd have to have the water level all maybe all the way at the top and then dip yourself in and keep yourself swimming while you're trying to move a 20 pound lid over and then make it fit perfectly on, on the lip that it's supposed to fit on. But that was a major part of, uh, what was going on in the one day that there was a civil suit. Uh, I was literally in the audience watching the arguments for myself and the, the hotel was saying, um, there was no way for us to lock it cause there, there's no hinge on it. There's, so there was no possible way. And it was just ridiculous. It was like, how much is a couple hinges, you know, even to get them welded onto a steel tank like that. I mean, it had to be like a hundred dollars worth of equipment or uh, just put latches on two sides and then have two separate locks. There's definitely some way that they could have locked it. And we know that because they've added a lock to it since. So um, it's really weird that the court thing I've never seen uh, where a judge came out publicly and said that they were going to dismiss a case the weekend before it was even heard. 
in their courtroom. I, I, I've looked into hundreds of cases at this point. I've never seen that happen again. It just, it doesn't happen, but for some reason in this case it does. And it just once again points to, there does seem to be some money motivator in this. Um, especially if Santiago is getting paid and, and moving out of the country. Uh, it does seem like there's some big money aspect to this. And of course, you know, on a previous video, I did talk about Herb Chase. Um, this is someone that was part of a group that was managing the hotel. And I believe, if I recall correctly, a day after the discovery of Elisa's body, all of a sudden Herb is announced in a press release as joining a new um, kind of real estate conglomerate. And it always made me wonder, is the timing of that related for some reason? Was there something about her death that was being covered up where maybe they were just delaying the discovery of her body so this guy could, you know, get this new deal done. And then as soon as they knew that deal was done, they told, you know, Santiago, hey, it's time. Go up, go up and, and make the discovery. Um, right. And and John, it 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 ties back into uh the search of the roof. Uh the canine unit went up there, they searched the roof twice. The canine unit did not detect uh, her body. And, you know, there's two different can types of canine dogs. One searches for uh, living people. One searches for dead. Yeah. I don't know which one they had, uh, but the dogs didn't find anything. They didn't find traces of her having been up there in the first place. They didn't find and they didn't find her body. Now, an another thing, if the lid was open, it makes it even more likely that the dogs would have picked up her scent. Definitely. But, and this, you know, ties together a couple of different uh, data points here. We have a coroner who's saying that she was dead before she was in the tank. We have a financial incentive for them not to find the body. Then we have a canine unit that is not picking up the scent. Is it possible that they did not pick up the scent because her body was not yet in the tank? It's a really good question. Awesome. Yep. And I wish I had better. I wish I had more answers for you. And I, I do have, you know, more evidence from the book that I'm going to share with you. But there are still gaping holes in this case. And the more and more I look at it, these are gaping holes that are, to me, look like they're not being answered because, best case scenario, it was a botched investigation. Worst case scenario, we have some kind of gross negligence or some kind of straight up cover up, even if her death was, it was an accident. Yeah. And you, and you bring this up in your videos. Um, it's possible that her, her death could have been an accident and they still tried to cover it up because they did not want, I mean, the optics of it are obvious. They don't want a young woman being found dead in their water tank when they're about to sign a $200 million real estate deal with the largest real estate investment firm in the world, CDRE, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the, and just looking at the history of the hotel and the different purchases that have been tried to be, that have been made and then what the new owners wanted to do with it and constantly being kind of deadlocked by the city, you know, you had owners that wanted to make it a full hotel and get those residents out of there. You had owners that swung the other way and say, no, we want it to be all residents and we want to put social services in there. They get deadlocked. So it just, it really, I don't know. It's, it's, it seems like there's something else at play with it. I'm still stuck five years later with right. the feeling that there's something else at play there. Um, another cool aspect to the book is you kind of talk about, I, I think there might even be a chapter called Rise of the Web Sleuths, but you kind of talk about that whole phenomenon and uh, and dangers of social media and web sleuthing. I know you wanted to address that a little bit. So what what are your thoughts in terms of web sleuths where it came from, where we're headed. Well, the movement is, you know, fascinating. And yeah, there's a great book called The Skeleton Crew by Deborah Halber, who, who really painted a really just interesting portrait of the people that get involved in web sleuthing, uh, web sleuths that have even solved cases. Mm -hmm. um, there's just some incredible stories. And um, so, it, you know, the web sleuth movement started with this very great, noble intentions. And uh, I, I spoke with uh, Trisha Griffith, who runs uh, the WebSleuths.com website, mm -hmm. and she's very she's very interesting. And she uh, 
talks pretty in depth uh, to to Deborah and and to me in a separate interview about kind of uh, competing movements within the web sleuth community. There is a movement to kind of vet and centralize information before taking it to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's a contrasting movement, and these are the mavericks who think that, you know, they're a little bit more anarchistic in terms of wanting to spearhead when they find new evidence or new questions, spearhead it, go directly to the law enforcement. And so it's competing visions of it, and I'm sure the truth is somewhere in the middle of what the best approach may be. But in, in, in working on this case, um, one of the things I started noticing, and it became kind of a, one of the themes of the book, is uh, a lot of people that were obsessed to the point of, of you know, devoting their life to it, some of them had very unhealthy, borderline pathological uh, beliefs. And there's just no other way to put it. Um, I spoke to one guy who it's almost unbelievable that he actually thinks this, but he he believed that um, Elisa was already dead in the surveillance video and that these kind of, um, you know, Illuminati type handlers were basically using these latches and 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 belts to hold her up in this video and that she was dead. And then as it got further into it, he would say that you can see faces in the video and that they're uh, demons and also invisible people. And this guy just blew my mind because when we first started talking, he sounded totally reasonable. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and then, and he also said that he had found evidence that thought solved the case and that he had approached the family with it. So then I was really um, surprised, like, oh, wow, this guy's really going for it. And then to find out that what he's talking about is just something that's so um, just pathological. Uh, it's so dangerous to the web sleuth movement um, to have people uh, bothering LAPD. And look, I, I have many problems with the LAPD. Um, but one thing we don't need are, are people to be going to them and saying that they found a, a demon that that is responsible for a death. And then to find out that he's actually approaching the family or tried to approach the family, that is just uh, unethical to the point of just like you're risking the entire web sleuth movement by doing that because you're going to end up having law enforcement uh, locked down on this. You're going to end up having them uh, push Congress to create legislation that that bars people from posting information about a case while it's in motion. I mean, there's so many ways that this is bad. But at the at the forefront, it's just not that is so not right to the family. And it happens all the time in these cases where people go to the families, message them and say, I found the truth of what happened to your to your loved one. And these people are dealing with pain that we just cannot imagine. And to go to them with with, I mean, sloppy evidence at best. Some of this stuff is not even evidence. It's not even circumstantial evidence. It's straight just delusion. Fiction. Yeah. 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 It's so strange to me that um, it it just happens with this case time and time again. And I remember when I was first putting out videos on this and first starting to hear from people, I was hearing from one person in particular and he was posting, I have a picture of Elisa in the room that night and here's a picture of her being tied up and you, you know who I'm talking about. And here's here's audio of, you know, um, her being assaulted in the room. And it, uh, are you talking about Wilhelm? Yeah. 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 He, he uh, and I ended up having I mean, this guy straight up has f- fan fiction videos basically on YouTube. Uh, the most unhinged material I've ever seen in my life. Um, 20 videos at least about her death. Uh, that is just, it's straight up fan fiction about her being sexually assaulted. And it's, and again, with him, what was so shocking is that he was, knew the case inside and out. Yeah. He knew the details of the case so well that he was able to fudge them together and create this narrative. And I ended up speaking with him for a little bit and he got very hostile at one point. And I ended up having to block him because he was, uh, I mean, he wasn't at the point where he was threatening me, but it was leaning in that direction. And so this is, you know, it's, John, it's just all part of what differentiates the kind of work that you do and which is very important. And then, uh, you know, 
free, there's freedom of speech in this country and people are welcome to say what they want and they're welcome to make videos about it. But at some point you have to really consider what your end game is and what some of the larger repercussions could be from from some of these conspiracy theories. Yeah, I have nothing. I have no bad feelings about anyone where you can tell their intent is actually to be helpful. Right. You know, even if they have some information that maybe they're putting a little too much stock into and I wouldn't with my experience, I, I totally understand that we're all different people. We have different perspectives, different backgrounds. That's part of what I believe in, in terms of kind of crowdsourcing, putting information out like this and then getting feedback and looking at that and changing your point of view. Um, I, I never see anything wrong with that, but this there's been a lot of people where it looks like they're fictionalizing aspects of this story in particular because they want attention of some kind or because they're trying to move the conversation from the realities of what's going on with Elisa to some belief structure that they have and then put that forward. And at the start of this video, you kind of said it, how uh, Elisa's story, really everyone looks at it and they kind of associate themselves in some way to it. Um, and I think there are realistic or more appropriate ways of doing that, such as you did with the book. You know, you saw parallels between what you were going through and what she had gone through previously, and you were essentially learning from her writings in some ways. Um, and then there's the other end of that spectrum where you have people that are essentially doing fan fiction about this case, which is, um, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty insane. And between me and them, somehow it all boils down to neurotransmitters, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I, just, I did want to touch on the documentary. Uh, I know this was a kickstarted project. I know that you guys were working really hard on it at one point. What's the status of the documentary currently? Right. Yeah. We were going really hard on the documentary for a while and, you know, still are, uh, basically. And, and, you know, we had just an incredible, um, group of people that helped us fund the first part of this movie and we you know we i love our kickstarter donators so much and each of them are going to receive a copy of my book it's you know I, that's the least i can do for them at this point uh the documentary is still in motion and it will be completed <laughs> it will be accomplished at some point um as you know people know uh you know we raise after taxes we raise like you know twenty three thousand dollars or something like that that is enough to kickstart a project but um, documentaries these days often have a budget of a million or more. Even a low budget documentary has a budget of 250,000. So unfortunately, you know, 20 grand just isn't enough to complete a whole documentary. Um, so we are in somewhat of production hiatus right now. And part of that was also me researching and, and completing the book. Yeah. And yeah. also part of it is that the hotel is closed right now. And so, uh, you know, we, we want to wait for that hotel to open. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's an image that I simply must get. And it, it, it has to do with the renovations they're doing to this hotel. And I'm sure you've heard of this, but, uh, you know, I hope it's not true. You're talking I about hope it's not true either. Yes. Uh, we, we know what we're talking about and I'm yeah, sure your audience yeah. does too, but we'll go ahead and say it. So one of the planned renovations was that they were going to build a pool and a bar on the roof where Lisa died. Yeah. Yeah. Which I hope if they do that, they're going to build some kind of protection up there because there was nothing to stop someone from stepping right over the edge and you're going to be serving alcohol up there. You're going to, this is, I mean, and in the book I write about how I have this vision of this dark tower is still there in a thousand years. I just feel like this cycle of, of horror that keeps trundling through this hotel over generations and generations, whether it's suicides, the dozens of people that have jumped out the windows, uh, the murders, rapes that have gone on there, um, are yeah. convicted. Serial killers. Yeah. Convicted sexual offenders living there. I mean, sexual. it's just, yeah, absolutely. And, and I just feel like it, it this cycle is repeating itself and, and John, I mean, I, and I found, I mean, I spoke with a lot of people that used to live at the hotel and one of them, just, I mean, she is passionately devoted to the idea that they, they should raise it to the ground. She says that, that this hotel is just rotten to the core. I mean, she believes it's haunted, but it goes beyond that. She, I mean, she personally knew women 
that friends of hers that uh, one in particular that was raped mm -hmm. in the Cecil Hotel by an employee like this was this was an allegation that this young woman made she said that a uh, Cecil Hotel employee used the master key to enter her room sexually assault her and then essentially extorted her under threat of eviction um, to not tell her story and this woman cannot is not in a position where she can um, risk her housing to make an accusation that, that may not go anywhere. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, just a horrible, there's a horrible backstory. I mean, I will, and you touched upon this, I will give credit to the hotel for consistently being a place where low income people can live in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, it's not for lack of trying. I think they wanted to gentrify it uh, with the rest of the downtown. But I, I, you know, I'll give credit where credit is due, and they are uh, providing housing for low-income people, which is great. But um, it seems like there was, for many, many years, if not decades, there was uh, just a free-for-all of people committing any crime they wanted. And um, yeah, it's interesting because the last time I was down there, it seemed like the gentrification efforts were actually kind of rolling backwards. You know, there there was some places that were opening up and you could see there was a little money that was going in on that block in particular. And then the next time I go down there, all of a sudden the health food store isn't open anymore and the bar on the corner is closed. And so I'm really not sure what's going on with that place in, in terms of what direction it's headed. Um. We do have a, another special thing to share with all of you here, um, and it's kind of related to the documentary. Now, on next week's episode of Brain Scratch, we're going to show pretty much the whole extended interview of me sitting down with a body language expert. Her name is Sandy Hu, and we're going to share all that exclusive footage with you from the kickstarted Elisa Lam documentary. But we have a little clip of Sandy speaking here that we're going to share with you in this episode. And this is Sandy talking about the perspective of the Chinese community on Elisa's case and what she thinks might be going on with it. In Chinese community, people are discussing all kinds of details about the case and the people coming up all kinds of theories of how she was how she ended up in, in the water tank. As you said, there were, there were a couple investigators coming all the way from China to look into the case. They stayed in the hotel, measured the water tank to try to, uh, try to rewalk the walk of Elisa Lam to figure out what happened there. And there's even a, a horror movie was made in China that is based on the story of Elisa Lam. So I think, Originally, they're trying to make a documentary to recreate how things happened because a lot of elements and details were not addressed, so they cannot find out the truth. That's why it ended up being a movie, because it's based on a true story. I think it's about money. Let's say a murder case happened in a hotel, right? It's, it's going to hurt their reputation badly. Maybe it's going to end up at the closure of the hotel. So I can pay you a, a big chunk of money for you to close your mouth up. Just be quiet. Then this is going to eventually um, maintain the reputation of the hotel. And also, it's going to make case easy for LAPD as well. They don't need to do a thorough investigation. It's going to save a lot of their staff. I feel really, really sorry for the family, and it must be really hurt, because I personally have family members who lost their kid, and I know how it feels. They suffered from the pain for years and years to come in, and this case, people are discussing this case still now, after four years. So I think that's one of the reasons why the family moved back from Canada to Hong Kong, to just avoid all the noise. But I think it's important for them to have the courage to find the truth for their daughter. So, uh, Jake, when I met Sandy, uh, she didn't know my work. She didn't know my videos. And there we hear her making a, con a conclusion very similar to what we're talking about here today, that she thinks it's about money. And she thinks there's some reason why there's some form of cover up going on there. You have any uh, thoughts or feedback on that clip? Yeah, I mean, San Sandy is a uh, Cinderella. She's a you know very intelligent and interesting uh, person, and and she was one of you know two people that did extensive body language uh, analyses of the surveillance tape. Um, and yeah, she, I mean, 
the conclusion she draws, I mean, it, it, I think it strikes most people that have looked. There, there's a couple different tiers of how people look at this case, and there's the um, kind of peripheral people that are just kind of um, um, entertained by the spectacle of it, and then there's people that dig a little deeper, and and you know think that maybe you know, a lot of people dig a little closer and say, oh, it was just an accident. And then there's people that dig even further. And the further to the center you get, uh, the more problematic some of the gaps in knowledge are and some of the silences are from uh, the people that would be in charge of telling the public what happened in this case. And I think uh, Sandarella is, is on the mark in terms of the it, it's first of all, it's tragic, uh, as we said before, what happened to the family. Um, I don't blame them for never wanting to speak to anyone, and uh, it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just awful. Um, and you know, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get a case reopened. Period. Um, it's virtually impossible to get it reopened without the family. Um, and so I, I don't know what kind of traction we're going to have here as far as looking into the Cecil Hotel, uh, especially given that the Cecil Hotel just got land, historical landmark status, um, which uh, is going to make it uh, a little bit more difficult, I think, to dig into its history. Yeah. Oddly, I, ironically enough, it's a historical landmark, has a history of horror, but we won't be able to get to the bottom of some of the horrors. Uh and so, yeah, I don't know what the future is going to be as far as pushing this case forward. Uh, what I'd hope to do is at least present some new information that we can work with uh, to try and maybe push people to speak up if there's anyone out there who, who knows what happened. And, uh, you know, even if even if the information they have is that it was an accident, um, there were people at that hotel that saw what happened that night. And uh, there, there's, there's information out there. There's the women that stayed with Elisa in her room and reported strange behavior and asked to have her move to a different room. They've never been interviewed. They've never been identified in any way. Uh, so we don't know anything about that. So it's just, it's just incredible, John, that for as viral and popular as this case is, how little is known. Yeah, and I almost wonder why LAPD hasn't done some type of initiative, like get one of your public information officers to go through that case file, and if if there's nothing to hide here, put all this to rest. Right. Share the critical pieces of information, answer the questions that we've been asking for years now, and really put this to rest for that family's sake. But even that, we're we're not getting any cooperation on, and I don't know. It's um, there's a whole lot more that I get into uh, with Sandy as we're doing the interview. We're going to release it here on the channel next week, and it includes most of her analysis of the body language. You guys really don't want to miss that. I was very, very proud of it. Uh, the day that we shot it, I remember us going and having dinner after, and I was telling you, I was like, that's one of the most amazing things that I've had happen around this case was me getting to speak to Sandy and to learn about uh, what she sees in the elevator footage. It's one of the most in-depth reviews of the elevator footage I think you guys are ever going to see. So that's going to be released on the channel next week. And I wanted to give a very big thank you to Jared Salas, your co-producer. Uh, also Simon White, who helped us film on that day. And of course, all the wonderful Kickstarters who backed the Elisa Lam, Elisa Lam documentary. Uh, and stay tuned, much more to come next week. So Jake's book, Gone at Midnight, is being released on Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. He's got numerous appearances coming up, mostly on the West Coast. Um, however, if I can get you out here to the snow in Minnesota, maybe we can make something happen someday here. Uh, if you want to... <laughs> if you want to learn more about his appearances, where you can find him, be sure to follow him on Twitter at uh, Twitter <laughs> at Over the Moon SF. I get all that right? Yes, SF. And uh, yes, you got it right. And uh, some of the dates are still up in the air. But um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to be doing, a, I guess it's called a book tour. Uh, kind of Kind of nervous about it, actually. I've never done that before. And See, I'm much more at ease talking to someone like you about the case 
uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, the, the book is, uh, it's gone at midnight, uh, the mysterious death of Elisa Lam. And, um, you know, you can find more information about it, uh, at my Twitter page. If I'll be announcing dates and whatnot. And um, I'll probably have more information going up on the ghost diaries too. Um, but yeah, but yeah, John, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate all the work you put into this. I'm thankful that we've gotten to know each other and work professionally together. And I think this is the beginning of a, of a long and fruitful uh, friendship both professionally and personally. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been great getting to know you, Jake. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. And uh, if anyone does want to find a copy of Gone at Midnight, I'm going to have a link in the description box below to uh, not only his Twitter account, but it's already on sale at Amazon. So you can jump over, you can pre-purchase it. Um, I believe there's Kindle edition, hard copy, all kinds of different ways to get it. So be sure to check that out. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.